Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us today for our first webinar in 2023, Maximizing Motivation for Employee Wellbeing. I'm Melina Kambitsi, the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Strategic Marketing here at the Alliance, and we're very excited to have, to have you join us today. You're all in mute mode, uh, as the computer just told us, but we still want to hear from you. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions or get help with any technical challenges you may be experiencing. You can download the slides and other handouts directly from the GoToWebinar platform. And for our brokers consultants in our audience, if you wish to claim CE credits for this event, please download and sign a copy of the affidavit. The recorded video of today's event will also be made available for on-demand viewing for the, from the events page of our webs, website, and we will email a link to all attendees uh, next week. First, I would like to give a big thank you to our sponsors, Delta Dental and National Cooperative Rx. We're very grateful for their partnership, which allows us to bring these very valuable programs to all of you. In today's program, we're going to learn how to use internal motivation to more effectively engage employees and their families. I call them our families, employees and their families in their own well-being. We will also discuss what employers can do to remove barriers to care and help families, employees and their families, access the services they need to be healthy. Before we start, I wanted to just say a few words about why this topic is so important uh, before I get a chance to introduce our keynote speaker. Employee well-being has always been an important issue, but its importance has been exacerbated in the recent years by the pandemic, consistently rising healthcare costs, low levels of unemployment, and more recently rising wages as a result of the rising inflation. It is more important than ever that we can motiva motivate employees to take an active role in their health and well-being. If you need any help designing a health benefits plan that encourages your employees to utilize high value providers, please reach out to us. At the Alliance, we have years of experience guiding our employer members to benefit plans that provide the best healthcare options to their employees while managing at the same time healthcare spend. I would like now to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jessica Grossmeyer. Dr. Grossmeyer is an award-winning researcher and the author of Reimagining Workplace Wellbeing, Fostering a Culture of Purpose, Connection, and Transcendence. She's a leading voice in workplace well-being, having dedicated her career to identifying evidence-based strategies that promote a thriving workforce. Jessica is a frequent speaker at national conferences. She serves on several advisory boards devoted to helping employers create a workplace of culture that fosters, a, a, excuse me, a workplace culture that fosters employee well-being. And now by popular demand, I promised last year, last uh, February, when uh, we met with Jessica, that Jessica will be back, but by absolutely popular demand, she's also a returning speaker here at the Alliance. On a more personal note, Jessica uh, is uh, was born and raised in Wisconsin. She now lives outside the San Francisco Bay Area, where she enjoys hiking, yoga, reading, wine tasting, and any travel that allows her to combine those interests. We're so very happy, very pleased, very humbled to invite you back and to welcome you back, Jessica. Thanks so much, Melina. It's great to be back. Thank you for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. And I wanted to mention that since I've been here last, I have published a book. <laughs> and I mentioned that because a lot of what I'm going to be incorporating into today's session, I actually included in my book. And so this is research I've come across and I've been thinking a lot about this topic since our session last year. I am not plugging my book. What I'm doing is making you aware that I'm gonna give away three copies of my book to a random selection of participants who register for my book giveaway by end of business today. That's end of your business day today. 
And when you do that, you just go to the URL at the bottom of the screen and fill out a contact form. Select book giveaway in the menu. And then in the body of the form, provide your US mailing address. I do not use that information for marketing or solicitation or any other kinds of emails or communications. I'm not gonna send you stuff that you don't want. This is just so that I can know where to send your book if you're selected. And again, you need to do that by the end of the day today. For those who do not get selected to receive my book, I will be emailing you information on some of the resources that I'll be talking about today and some of the strategies that I'm talking about today so that you have more of a practical guide on how to incorporate some of these ideas into the work that you do. So um, again, let's try to do that by end of your business day today. So we're gonna go to a poll next because I would like to know how many of you attended the session last year in February on this topic of engaging employees and their families in their health and well-being. So you can select from the poll if you attended live, if you watched the recording afterwards, if you did not attend or watch the recording, or if you're not sure you just don't remember a year ago if you if you participated in that, select one of those options because that allows me to know how much I need to connect the dots between what was discussed last year and what was discussed this year. And it's kind of nice to know if we've got mostly repeat or if it's a lot of new folks joining us today. So I'll give you a chance to select your option before we move on. And in terms of results, 75% are not familiar with that content. Okay, so I'm going to be giving you some steps for what will be covered today. And if you want more information on what I covered last year in February, I will refer to what I covered last year. So be, be assured that you'll, you'll be getting complimentary, not duplicative information here. So why is it that we need to still address this topic of engaging employees in their health and well-being? We know that it's not because people don't want to change their lives. They don't want to live unhealthy lives. And a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. We are about six weeks into the new year, and we know from research that 92% of people fail to achieve their New Year's resolutions. In fact, the most popular day to quit your New Year's resolutions and abandon them altogether is actually January 13th. So um, we are well past that date. And it's not because people don't have the information that they need. It's not because they are not wanting to change their behavior. They set these resolutions not intending to fail and yet 92% of people fail. And so we need to help our employees and their families to understand how to build motivation that lasts and endures throughout the year. Many employers and health plans offer employees and their families health and well being programs, but only 25 to 32% take advantage of them, according to this research by Gartner. And it's not because they're not aware of them in this case. This is a survey of employees, and they're saying that they are aware of the physical, the financial, the emotional, and mental well being programs, but they are self reporting that they did not take advantage of them. Why might this be? So we're gonna talk in a moment about some of the barriers that we need to help employees and their families overcome, but I think part of it has to do with motivation as well. When individuals participate in programs like these, whether they're offered through their employer, their health plan, or in the community, and they fail, it reinforces this mindset that this is not gonna work for me, and so why should I participate again? And so we need to be digging deeper to address intrinsic motivation. But there are other barriers to participation in use that research tells us we can overcome as well. Each of the bullet points on this slide represent research that's been done showing if you increase awareness with comprehensive communications, people are more likely to participate. That means not just doing it once a year during benefits enrollment time or at the start of the year, but all through the year, having an enduring presence of here's what's available to you that you might not have caught last time we communicated about it. And that's because we tend to have selective awareness. When people um, are not needing a specific resource, they tend to ignore information about it. But when people are finding themselves with a health concern, then they're more aware, then they're looking around. So we need to have that enduring presence of communications all throughout the year in multiple different formats. 
We also know from research that increasing access to programs and services for the whole population, especially family members, can be really helpful. Not only do you have role modeling and peer support when that happens, but you can also communicate more effectively when you're dealing with whole populations as opposed to segments. For those of you who are employers, allowing participation during paid work time has been shown to increase participation. Decreasing the cost of access, and we're gonna talk more about that towards the end of our session today. Engaging leaders as role models and participants can be an important way to encourage participation and offering financial incentives. So I talked about many of these strategies during last year's presentation. I talked about the research around incentives, and I talked about some of these other organizational and leadership support strategies that can be used. But for those of you who are associated with a health plan or you don't have oversight of what happens at the specific worksite setting, we need additional strategies. And so if you're interested in building a culture of health, an organizational support system for your programs, tune in to last year's webinar. The event recording is still available on the website under events on the Alliance webpage. And so if you're interested in that, you can go look at that. Today's information, we are gonna cover some new ground. We are gonna talk about intrinsic motivation for building an enduring and sustained behavior change for employees and their families. So today's session is going to talk about intrinsic or internal motivation. I'll start with an overview of what that means. And then I'm gonna provide four different strategies or approaches that you can use to build intrinsic motivation within your employees or family members. And those four strategies are starting with mindset, helping people to think about why they're participating in a certain health behavior for the right reasons, according to research. Helping them think about what matters most to them, and we're going to talk about purpose and how purpose development can help us to build a healthier lifestyle. We're going to talk about values and helping people to think about their values and how they want to show up as their best selves in the world, the research linking that to healthier living. And then finally, we're going to talk about who matters most to people, our relationships, and how we can build that desire to have strong and healthy relationships into our health and well being strategies. So these are four different motivation strategies that I'll go over today. And by the end, know that you don't have to do all of these. That's overwhelming. If we can just help individuals to find one, or if you can lean into just one of these strategies, that can be a help and augment some of these other things that you're doing to decrease participation barriers. So let's go to our next poll, because I'd like to know today, before we get into our content, what strategies do you most rely on to increase use of well-being benefits and resources. And just select the one that you rely on most. Is it about raising awareness, allowing use during work time if that's an option, decreasing cost to access, offering financial incentives, or this last one, strengthening internal or intrinsic motivation? and seeing our results pop up here. Okay, about 25% offering financial incentives. That's very similar to what we saw last year with folks that tuned in. 63% raising awareness about offerings. That is the most popular strategy by far. Not as quite as many with the other strategies. And strengthening intrinsic motivation is one that very few are, of you are using. And so this session is going to help you talk about how, well, how, we can, how can we augment some of these other strategies. These others are still important and they are effective, but let's talk about how to build intrinsic or internal motivation. So let's turn our attention to motivation as a driver of participation and start by understanding how engagement in motivation work. So let's start with what it actually means. What is motivation? Quite simply, it's the reason why we act in certain ways. And there are many different forces, biological, emotional, social, and cognitive forces that can influence how we act. Motivation can support us in initiating a new behavior, continuing one that we started, or maintaining our behaviors over the long term. There are two different types of motivation, extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is some type of pressure or influence 
that comes from outside of us and influences us to act in a certain way. Intrinsic motivation is internal motivation. It surfaces and bubbles up from within us, not due to external forces. Both types of motivation can be influenced and changed. But what we know from research is that when we're looking at simpler, more concrete health behaviors, one and done, getting your flu shot, for example, going to do your annual physical, those are behaviors that are more responsive to extrinsic motivations because they don't require an enduring every single day kind of decision that we have to make. Intrinsic motivation, on the other hand, is very important for more complicated behavior change. The kind of thing where you have to make a decision multiple times a day, every single day, in order to make that a behavior that becomes a habit. And so intrinsic motivation is what builds and sustains healthier habits over time. Both are important. So let's get into our first motivation strategy, and that is helping people to align with their right why. And when we talk about the right why, we're talking about our mindsets. So in this book by Kelly McGonigal from Stanford, she talks about willpower and its role in behavior change. And what she says is that when we have a specific goal in mind and we encounter some sort of resistance or challenge, we need more willpower or self-control to overcome it. According to research, if we can help people to align with the right why, and remember, motivation is about our why for the reason why we do something. If we can align people with the right why, the right motivation, that can actually help them to overcome a challenge or resistance using less willpower, which gives us more willpower available for the rest of the decisions that we have to make. And so it's important for us to talk about how to develop the right motivation, the right why for our healthy living. Other research that helps us understand, well, what is this right why? How do I find that? Is Michelle Seeger. She's a University of Michigan researcher, and she has spent her entire research career focusing on motivation, specifically motivation to live an, a, an active lifestyle. Physical activity is her behavior of focus. And she talks about in her research, identifying less helpful or unhelpful wise and more helpful or right wise. Unhelpful wise are those that originate outside of ourselves. So now we're talking about extrinsic motivation. Oftentimes we're focused on pleasing another person. This could be our doctors, our spouses, our partners, a family member. It could be succumbing to peer pressure. We're doing it because someone else says so. Oftentimes unhelpful or less helpful whys are abstract or clinical. Things like losing weight, controlling your blood pressure, preventing diabetes. Those are all things that are abstract and clinical kinds of outcomes and they're less helpful for motivation. At the end of the day, oftentimes these unhelpful whys feel like shoulds. I'm doing this because I should, not because I really want to. And oftentimes we're focused on a maybe someday long-term goal out in the future. If I do this enough, then maybe eventually I'll see this long-term goal realized. It's not something that we're gonna to expect to experience today, immediately. And oftentimes we perceive these less helpful whys as a chore. It makes us, gives us the mindset that the very behavior we're trying to change is a chore and it's something we don't wanna do. It's taking our medicine. More helpful whys, on the other hand, originate from within ourselves, not from external sources. So now we're talking about intrinsic motivation. It focuses on what about this behavior is actually pleasing to me? What am I going to benefit from immediately? It's associated with specific positive feelings or emotions. Oftentimes it feels like something we actually want to do and it promises us a shinier, healthier, healthier right now. It's not something we have to wait for because we identify these specific benefits in the real time moment or shortly thereafter. When we add all these helpful whys up, it can help us to develop a mindset that this behavior that we're trying to make a habit is actually a gift that we give ourselves. And so that is the shift that we wanna see happen. How do we move people from the mindset of these unhelpful whys and perceive health behaviors as a chore to these more helpful whys and perceiving the same health behavior as a gift that we give to ourselves? It can be helpful to share an example. And this comes from Dr. Seeger's own research. 
And so she did a study where she invited overweight women to participate in this, and she divided them into two groups. Both groups were given the same one mile walking course. One group was set off and said, you're gonna go and do a walk to exercise. The other group, given the same exact map, same walk, told, you're gonna be doing this walk for fun. That was the only difference. And so both groups logged the same mileage, but when they came back and they measured people's perceptions of that walk, they realized that they had experienced that walk in very different ways. Those, exercise, those who were walking to exercise reported feeling more depleted, more fatigued, and in a worse mood than individuals who said that they were walking for fun. And so this was just a mind shift, a mindset difference that people were making. One had this orientation of exercise is work, and the other had this orientation of we're doing this for fun. And that alone influenced the subsequent choices that people made, because when they were released to go into a lunch area, those who were walking for exercise ate more unhealthy snacks and sugar beverages than people who were walking for fun. And so the researchers have replicated this finding with other groups of people and with other behaviors and found that mindset, in fact, does matter. How we think about our health behaviors influences how we feel about them. And it can help us to develop different mindsets to develop healthier habits like eventually losing weight and preventing diabetes. But when we orient around those reasons, they are not the most helpful motivators for us. So mindset matters. How do we help the people that we work with to achieve this shift in mindset? Well, it comes from focusing on the immediate benefits and that's what we need to encourage people to do. What are the immediate benefits that I can experience right now or shortly after that specific behavior is done? And so we'll be getting into that in a second. The reason why we need to go into some of those immediate benefits is because when we do that, we are identifying the right whys for the health behavior. And this can inspire a successful cycle of motivation for people. And so in this particular example, the right whys are associated with physical activity. Research shows that some of the immediate benefits of physical activity are, if we're doing it with other people, we can build stronger connections with others. It can elevate our mood, improve our mental focus, give us more energy. And at the end of the day, if we're picking, helping people to select the right physical activity, it can actually be fun. And so these are all the right whys. And so when somebody develops these mindsets, they focus on these benefits, then the behavior of movement actually becomes a gift that they give themselves. It's something that they actually want to do. And that makes them more likely to succeed in actually completing the behavior over and over and over again. And each time they complete that behavior, and they focus on those immediate benefits, they're reinforcing the cycle of motivation. Now this can go in the opposite direction too. If people are oriented around the wrong whys, things that they can't experience the benefits of right away, like weight loss for exercise, then they are perceiving this as a chore. This is a have to, it's not something I want to do, it's a should. And when people have that mindset around a specific behavior, it actually makes them less likely to succeed. And then that reinforces this mindset of this is hard. I don't want to do this. I'm not good at this. I should abandon it. So that actually can deplete our motivation. And I feel like that's what's happened for a lot of people. They've tried before. They haven't succeeded. They figure, why try again? So if we can orient people around different reasons for the same behavior change, that can be helpful. And so now let's talk about what some of those immediate benefits might be. Many different health behaviors have been associated with real-time benefits. And so we might need to tap into the research to help people understand what some of these are. Some of these are gonna be things that people might not think of on their own, which is why we need to provide support. And so a focus on immediate benefits can be things like, when I do this, I have more creativity, which we know is often the case when it comes to physical activity. Maybe if we help them to design the healthy eating behavior or the activity or sleep in some way that it's more enjoyable to them, that becomes more of an immediate benefit. Many different health behaviors are associated with higher levels of energy, a positive mood, higher levels of performance, being able to think more clearly and mentally focus, feeling more rested or refreshed, 
or simply feeling a sense of accomplishment. This is something that's challenging and I did it. I specifically completed this precise behavior change. And that can be about helping people focus more on the behavior in, instead of on these long-term goals. And so at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is help people to think about the immediate benefits of the health behavior that we have in mind. And we might need to help them with this. So in terms of practical application for this first strategy, one of the ways we can apply this is to our communications. Now, many of you said that that is one of the primary motivation strategies that you use or participation strategies is communications. One thing we can do in our communications is look at the messaging, focus more on immediate benefits and communicate what some of those things are. So if it's healthy eating, what are some of the immediate benefits that people can experience in real time associated with healthy eating? or physical activity, or getting better sleep, or practicing presence. We can also consider how we name our programs. And sometimes our program names actually set that mindset of the wrong why. One really good example of this is weight loss. How many times have you seen a weight loss program called a weight loss program? Instead of focusing on weight loss, we could focus on a program name that talks about the specific kinds of behaviors or benefits people can experience just by participating in the program. We can also rebrand our programs around specific behaviors or the immediate value. And let me give you a couple examples. One is Dr. Seeger was approached by a community organization that were offering a program where they were gonna focus on helping people to walk commit to walking 20 minutes a day. And they called it Pledge 20. That was the name of the program. When they went to Dr. Seeger and asked her what her opinion was of this, she said, you know, Pledge, it makes me sound like you're asking me to commit to something and that makes it sound like work and it's piling on top of all the other things that I have to do. And so now that feels like a chore. It's something that I should do. I'm pledging to do this, therefore it must be hard. And she said, well, how about coming up with something that's, that's more positive? something that gives people immediate sense of value of what they're gonna experience when they walk for 20 minutes. And so they changed the name to Celebrate 20. And Celebrate 20 just has a whole different connotation to it, doesn't it? We think about, wow, this is 20 minutes when I'm gonna celebrate being out in nature, being unshackled from my desk. The gift I give back to myself is this 20 minutes of walking and movement. And so just the name shift helps us to align with a more positive why. Rebranding programs can look different too. An organization called DTE Energy is a specific utility company based in Detroit, Michigan, and they used to call their programs and their actual wellness initiative names that were associated with less helpful whys. They rebranded their entire program, all of their initiatives related to well-being around Energize Your Life. It was sort of a play on the DTE energy name, but they said, you know, when you look at most of the health behaviors that our programs focus on, they're going to get more energy as a result of getting better sleep, making healthier choices, connecting with people socially than anything else. So let's actually focus on energize your life. And that became a more positive brand for the entire set of initiatives. A final way that we can apply this is by coaching or guiding our employees to shift from rational, logical shoulds for a health behavior to more emotional, positive feelings helping to coach them through, well, what's actually beneficial about this to you? Again, it helps to be able to provide them with some research that helps them to understand what's actually happening in their bodies when they make these healthier choices. And there's a fascinating amount of research that can point to positive mental and emotional and other kinds of immediate rewards that people can experience. So that's the first strategy, identifying a mindset that helps us to frame the behavior as something that is a gift and not a chore. Our next motivation strategy focuses on helping people to identify what matters most to them. So now we're talking about purpose, purpose in life. And this is a second strategy with a lot of different research underneath it. What does it mean to have a sense of purpose? It means to have a strong sense of direction for your life. It is that north on your compass that pulls you through life, overcoming challenges, because you've got this sense of direction and purpose for your life. It's often the answer to questions such as, why am I here? Not as in why am I at this webinar right now, but why am I here on earth? Why do I exist? What am I living for? What matters most to me? What causes do I care about? 
What am I most grateful for? What do I want to contribute to? What am I good at? Do I have unique gifts or strengths that I can bring into the world? Just asking people to reflect on these questions builds a stronger sense of purpose and direction for people's life. Now, they are deep questions, so it's not something you're going to be able to just do in a five-minute conversation. They're, they're things that we can help people to reflect upon, and it can help build a stronger sense of purpose. Now, you might be saying to yourself, what does this have to do with healthy living? What's the connection? And there is actually a lot of research that can help us here. What we have found is that when people have a stronger sense of purpose, they have more energy and more willpower to live a healthier life. And so they found that people with a stronger sense of purpose are more likely to live longer and healthier lives. They make healthier life choices. And longitudinal time over time studies over years have found that when people have a strong sense of purpose at baseline, they're more likely to get better sleep and experience less sleep problems as they get older. They practice more presence or mindfulness. They're more physically active as they get older. They participate in more creative pursuits that bring joy to their life. And they practice healthier eating habits. There's a two-way relationship here because when people do these behaviors, they're actually now fueling more energy and willpower to live out their purpose in life. So this is a two-way relationship between purpose and health behaviors. And we know that increasing sense of purpose all by itself builds well-being. So there is a role for purpose development as part of well-being initiatives. Another reason why it's so important for us to talk about purpose is because there are a lot of people who have questions and doubts about their purpose, especially right now. And a lot of that is due to the pandemic that we've all been experiencing over the past few years. When people were asked, and we're gonna to go to the next slide, thank you. When, we, when people were asked about how the pandemic increased their questions about purpose, what they, what they found is that 59% said that they had a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. But only, that, that means that 41% had no sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. So that's a big gap. And 57% wondered about, well, how can I get more meaning and purpose in my life? A different survey of people asked how the pandemic changed their thinking about their life and their work. And they said 56% wanted to contribute more to his society as a result of that. It made them want to give back. And 52% were questioning the purpose of their daily work. And we've seen these kinds of questions about purpose play themselves out in the marketplace as people are now changing jobs so that they feel like they have more meaning and purpose in their work. And so what we know from research is that purpose is something that naturally wax and wanes over the course of our lives. It's something that's important to us, it's important to our well-being, and when we have a crisis of purpose or a shakiness about our purpose, that can influence our well-being. And so just providing people with supports to build and maintain a healthy life purpose over their lives can actually help them with their well being. And how do we do this? A book by Victor Strecker talks about this. Now, Vic Strecker is a University of Michigan researcher who has been devoted his whole career to behavior change science. And he had a bit of a crisis himself when he, his young daughter passed suddenly in her 20s. And this brought him onto re examining his purpose in life. He captured his journey in this book, but it talks a lot about the connections between purpose and well being. And the way that he has continued to advance his work in bringing these things together is he introduces self reflection exercises into well being initiatives. He has gone on to develop a company that has a purpose development app. The company name is Kumanu, but there are a lot of free purpose development resources out in the marketplace that you can bring into your well-being programs. Purpose is a natural part of coaching conversations, whether those are life coaching, career coaching, or well-being coaching. And then many organizations are offering what's your why campaigns. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a second. But let's talk first about how we can help build purpose through helping people to articulate their purpose for themselves. And for many purpose development folks, it's about creating a written purpose statement that we can think about and we can tap into every single day. And so when we guide people to create a purpose statement, we often use verbs such as, my purpose is to help, 
to build, to create, to seek something. It's very action oriented. It's a representation of how they are making decisions and living out their life. It may reference report important relationships or life roles. Oftentimes purpose statements are broad and aspirational. They might not even be things that we can achieve during our lifetime. They can be simple as opposed to grand. We don't all have to cure cancer. There are other simpler purposes that we can have that can be equally profound. And at the end of the day, a purpose statement is something that should excite and energize you. It's the kind of thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. It might help to give you some examples of real life purpose statements. So these are real examples from real people who have gone through these kinds of purpose development exercises. And so my purpose in life is to relieve suffering and exercise compassion. I love that because there's an example of a purpose that you can apply at work, at home, and in your community. It's independent of circumstances. The next one is to live fully, experiencing each moment, aware, alert, and attentive. Look at all that action. This is about how somebody wants to bring their experience into each moment of their life. To be a source of light to other people and radiate positivity, to find an inner strength that inspires others. Now we're seeing that connection to wanting to give back and contribute to other people's lives, to make a difference. To love others unconditionally and to foster meaningful connections with people. So all of these are example of purpose statements and you can see that there is this enduring sense to them. They're not something that is a goal that you're gonna check off the list, but they can influence the changes that we make in our day-to-day -day lives. In terms of how to apply this kind of purpose development to practice in well-being, one can be to start to incorporate self-reflection about purpose into our programs. And remember, when people have a stronger sense of purpose, that all by itself is linked to living a stronger, happier, healthier life. And so there is a place for purpose development in our well-being programs. We can also guide individuals to identify how health supports their purpose. So when we think about, well, when you're thinking about moving more or eating healthier or quitting smoking, is there a specific way that that's going to support you in living out your purpose? And for many people, that's a pretty easy connection that they can make. And so the mindset, their why for well-being actually becomes this purpose statement. I'm doing this because I want to live out my purpose. Many organizations create what's your why campaigns. And we can do this by just providing some sort of mechanism for people to, first of all, reflect on their purpose, but then to share their why for healthy living in a campaign. And they can do this through an in-person bulletin board or a whiteboard. People can put sticky notes up writing their why. They can take a picture and put pictures up. Some organizations create a social media platform where people can share their why. And then other people actually encourage people to take little videos and to share those with their coworkers. We can also create opportunities to share what matters most to us in our group classes or with our coaches. So sharing, being able to articulate what your purpose is and sharing that with other people strengthens that sense of purpose. That's our second motivation strategy. We've talked about mindset and now we've talked about what matters most, our purpose. We're gonna talk next about a related way to build intrinsic motivation and that's through how we show up in the world. Now we're talking about our values in life. And this is strongly related to purpose because when people are writing out a purpose statement, often they are a reflection of what they value, but it is different. So when we talk about values, one of the things that researchers have found is that when people reflect on their values, it can actually help them foster healthier habits. When you look at MRI images, these are functional MRI imaging, when people are reflecting on their most important values, there's a certain part of the brain that is activated. And researchers have found that values thinking actually activates the part of our brain that is associated with being more open-minded about making behavior changes. Many studies that have demonstrated that when you affirm someone's core values, that it, sh it reduces their resistance to physical activity, healthier eating, even quitting smoking. This starts, this value affirmation exercise starts by helping people to identify their values. And this is just a partial list of values. If you were to use your favorite search engine and type in common core values, you're gonna get a much longer list. But it can start by helping people to think about and identify, well, what are the things I value most in the world? And then we can go deeper and say, well, what does it look like when I live that value out in my life? 
And then we can go even deeper and say, well, if I have a health behavior, how can being healthy, living a healthier life actually help me to live out my values? So those are ways that we can do this. This last piece might be a little bit hard to imagine. So let's give you a real world example of this. And this comes from my own life. I did a lot of values reflection a few years back. And one of the things I realized is I have always had an enduring value on my relationships. It's one of my most important decision-making and prioritizing values is I want strong relationships in my life, at work, at home, in my community. One of the behaviors that I've been working on over the past three years now is building a daily meditation habit. And it's been a really tough one to get me to, to make stick. And so I took this work on values affirmation. I said, well, how can I actually use this information to help me strengthen this meditation habit? And so I started to think about, well, what does meditation actually do for me? What are the immediate benefits of it? So now we're getting a little bit back to some of that earlier information. But I realized that it helps me to be more fully present to myself and to others around me. It helps me to focus my energy and pay better attention to people. I become a better listener. I'm a calmer and less reactive person. And I, at the end of the day, avoid saying things that I'm gonna regret when I'm stressed out. All of these things add up to strengthening my relationships. And so I created a statement for myself to affirm this link. When I'm able to do my meditation, it helps me to respond better to the people in my lives and build stronger relationships. And so when I make that decision every morning at 5 a.m., am I going to do my meditation or not? I remember this is going to make me show up as my best self. It's going to help me to live the life that I want to live and to have healthier relationships. So this is the way that we can reinforce these ideas between our values and our behaviors. Some of this is talked about in a book by Jim Lair and Tony Schwartz called The Power of Full Engagement. That's where I first came across this idea of how our values can reinforce our healthy habits. Many people will say, I don't have enough time in my day to participate in this health behavior, whatever it is, make a healthy lunch, go for a walk, do the meditation app that I'm gonna do. What Jim Lair and Tony Schwartz say is, everybody has the same amount of time in the day, but we all have the opportunity to influence how much energy we put into different moments in our day. According to them, values can help us prioritize where we put our strongest energy. And they've developed this idea of value-based habits. These are intentional behavior patterns that can help align how we spend our energy and prioritize our time with our values. And that includes healthy living. If we incorporate value-based habits into our daily lives, it can reinforce healthy habits and support our values. And then those become self reinforcing. It can help to give you some examples of this, and I've already given you one. So I took four common health behavior areas. Meditation is one I'm focusing on, so I included that one at the top. Physical activity, healthy eating, better sleep. Four areas that people are focusing a lot on right now. Values I just picked kind of randomly, and the first value relationships I picked from my own life um, but there are others listed there as well. And then the idea is, can we come up with a way to link a health behavior and the value? And so these are just some that I came up with, and we need to work with individuals to come up with these for themselves. But the first one was establishing a daily meditation habit can help strengthen my relationships. If people's health area that they want to improve is physical activity, they value being excellent in their work. One idea might be taking a midday walk to a professional development podcast, for example, or perhaps they think to themselves, you know what, I'm going to devote a midday walk to problem solving or to clearing my head. And that's going to help me to come back and be more productive and focused in my work. With healthy eating, a lot of people have a strong sense of faith or spirituality. And oftentimes we see that show up in purpose statements in some way, or it's a name to value. Linking those things together would be encouraging people to think about praying or expressing appreciation or just thinking about how grateful they are for the healthy food that they have. When we're looking at the broccoli or the salad on our plate, thinking for a moment about how grateful we are to have access to healthy food, thinking about how colorful it is, thinking about the good it's gonna do for our bodies, that reflection can help reinforce a value with this health behavior. And then with getting better sleep, 
I use this example of a value of providing good patient care because caregiving is a role and a value that a lot of people have, especially if you are in a health services job or if you have elder care responsibilities or if you're a parent, you might have caregiving responsibilities. And so we know that when we sleep better, we're less likely to make mistakes, we're more likely to be calm, we're more likely to practice patience with people when they're aggravating. And so turning our screens off after 8 p.m., getting a better night's sleep can translate into being the better parent, the excellent healthcare worker or the caregiver that we wanna be. And these are all just examples. In terms of applying a values orientation to practice, one thing we can do is incorporate values affirmation techniques into health behavior change or coaching programs. And they have done this in the public health world. We have seen values affirmation proven to help people lose weight, quit smoking, um, even reduce their alcohol intake. We can include promotional messaging that prompts employees to think about healthy living and how it supports them showing up at, as their best and living their best life. We can incorporate value-based habits into coaching programs. And that's where value-based habits work fits best because we often need to coach people through some of these ideas using motivational interviewing and other effective strategies like that. So now we've talked about three ways to build internal motivation, we've talked about mindsets in the right whys, we've talked about purpose, we've talked about values. Now we're gonna talk about relationships identifying who is most important to us. And if people are having a problem figuring out, well, how do we talk about purpose and values? Sometimes starting with relationships is an easier strategy for people, but it's, it's all related because when you ask people what matters most to them or about their values, many times the most important relationships or their life roles are going to enter into the conversation. So this is another way to think about this. And I've already talked a little bit about relationships with some of the examples I've given, but let me give you some additional ideas about how we can leverage the power of our important relationships to help us with our healthy living goals. And the first one is around serving others. So many times, if we are in a leadership role, a health services role, a caregiving role, parenting role, often we think about our service to other people. We have to meet their needs first. And that could lead us to prioritize ourselves last. We see this with people who have deep passion for what they do every single day, whether they're a parent or they spend the majority of their day leading other people or they're a healthcare worker. The idea is I am all about serving other people and my heart beats for that. So how do we help them to make themselves a priority? Well, oftentimes people who have this passion to serve others feel like, they don't have time for themselves, and so they put themselves at the bottom of their priority list. And that's okay some of the time, but if we can encourage people to think about, well, when we take better care of ourselves, how does it actually help us to live out our passion for serving others? How does taking time for me to eat something healthy, get my activity, how does that help me to be a better parent, be a better and more productive coworker, be a better leader? And so the orientation is you need to, in some ways, make yourselves your own highest priority, at least some of the time, so that you can serve others better and live out your desire to be a good service provider. So that's one way we can help people to think about that. Taking care of myself is going to help me to serve others better. Another thing to think about, we're going to go past this slide and go to the next one, is being a positive role model. Many people, when they first become parents, realize, oh, it's time for me to quit smoking. It's time for me to cut back on alcohol. It's time for me to eat healthier because they want to be a positive role model for their kids. And we have seen this proven time and time again with different kinds of programs that people's motivation for being a positive role model actually inspires healthy living. This can also be applied to the work site or in our communities or in our family lives because when we participate in healthier behaviors, like choosing the broccoli over the french fries at the restaurant, research shows we influence other people, even perfect strangers. Research shows that when you make a healthier decision, it has an influence on people three removed from you. Your friend, your friend's friend, and your friend's friend actually can be influenced by behaviors, the behaviors that you make 
every single day. And so some people might say, well, I usually do my physical activity before work. It can be a motivator for them to be like, I want to be a role model for other people, so I'm going to bring that to work. Social support is another one. And we know that there's a lot of research that supports the relationship between healthier lives and social support. This becomes the motivation. So if they're thinking about their strongest relationships in life and the relationships that matter most to them, they can say, well, how could I invest in that relationship, but in a way that improves our health and well being? Now, strengthening our social ties all by itself is a health behavior. We know this from COVID because social support has become such a strong emphasis. But we also know that we can support people in meeting their healthy living goals. And so the orientation here is, well, we're going to get together and eat a healthy salad, but we're doing that to build relationship and to give one another support for this health behavior. So it shifts the motivation in their mind. It's about supporting one another and not just about, I need to do this for me. And so those are just three different examples. Applying this to practice, it starts by helping individuals identify their most important relationships in their life. That starts with the first one. And then to start to think about the link between living a healthier lifestyle and strengthening those relationships. That means prioritizing my self-care some of the time so I can show up as my best self for others. It means being a strong role model to support others' well-being and pursuing a healthy activity together to strengthen our relationship. All of these, the orientation is around the stronger relationship, but we can connect a healthy lifestyle to this. And some specific examples I can think of, my sister wanted to build a stronger relationship with her daughter when she entered her teen years, and she realized her daughter was really into art. And so they both signed up for art classes together. We know that practicing creative endeavors actually has health promoting benefits. The focus though wasn't on health, it was on building the stronger relationship. Finding a way to move together with a spouse or a friend can be a way to contribute to stronger relationships. So maybe don't get together for dessert, get together and go for a walk or take a dance class or go to Zumba together. These are all different ways that we can strengthen our health by focusing on stronger relationships. Wrapping this all up, I've now given you four different ways to build intrinsic motivation. Mindset, shifting people from this is a chore to this is a gift. Purpose, what matters most to me. Our values, how I show up in the world. And our relationship, who's most important to me. All of this relies on the same general pattern. We help people to think about these things. We give them the self-reflection, the why, the what, the how, the who. And then we inspire them to think about, well, how can my health actually support me? and living out my why or how can i think about why i'm living a healthier lifestyle in a different way or what it's in pursuit of or how it helps me to live my healthiest life so i'm curious of these four different strategies if you were to pick just one of them to focus on either for yourself or for those that you serve in your well-being efforts which one do you think you'd be most likely to lean into and this is just a curiosity for me i always like to see what gravitates or resonates most for people. So just select one of these. If you were to go a little deeper, which one of these four? And if you're not sure you need time to think about it, that's okay. <laughs> that's a totally valid response. I'm just curious to see what people will choose. And survey says purpose, 43%, 25%-ish for why with the mindset of a gift and who relationships. And then the values piece was the least popular, which is fine. And some of you wanna think about it some more. Not a surprise to me, people have been talking a lot about purpose lately. So thank you for sharing that. As a reminder, before we go into the um, Q&A portion, be entering your questions if you have not already into the control panel. But be sure to enter my book giveaway by the end of the day. I'll be talking more about how to do some of these things and the research underneath them in this book. But anybody who enters is going to get some free resources. So by the end of business day today, go to my website, fill out the form, and give me your US mailing address. I promise I do not use that for commercial purposes. I only use that so I know who to send the book to. So thank you so much for that. 
And now we're going to get into some questions. If you um, have some questions that don't come up during our session, we have a lot to answer. You can email me if you want to follow what I'm doing in this area. You can follow me on LinkedIn or go and check out my website for more free resources. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Melina and Jennifer. Well, thank you so very much, Jessica. What an amazing topic. Um, I was blessed to be able to have read your book ahead of um, uh, the presentation today. It is, if you don't win the book, it is totally, so I know you're not plugging it, I will. It is absolutely <laughs> totally worth it uh, to, get a, to get a hold of a copy. With your permission, Jessica, please stay on, don't, don't go, but with your permission, uh, this is such a very important topic, and many of our employers are also dealing with the topic of healthcare. So I just wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about the importance of removing barriers to health. Uh, so before we get into the questions, we have a lot of questions. We'll see. I'm going to go fast because I don't know how much time we have about 25 questions, I believe. So, um, so internal motivation, as we just discussed, and 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 I just loved the way that Jessica had um, yeah, talked about the 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 what, the why, the how, um, and our our purpose. Because you're right, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about purpose. Um, so all of these are very important in helping us lead a healthier life. What we know is also important for our employers is to remove barriers to accessing high quality, affordable care. So many of our Alliance employers, including ourselves, the Alliance as an employer, because we were absolutely the head of um, trusted advisors to our employers and network for our employers, but also we are an employer ourselves. Uh, we believe, so many of us believe in designing our benefit plans in a way to effectively guide our families to seek care from high value providers where we know quality is good and the cost is low. This doesn't only keep costs down for the employee. It makes it easier for an employee, for their family members to access care from a financial standpoint. It also keeps costs down for the employer. So how can employers guide employees to the right care? Well, we do so by designing benefit plans and and we'll talk a little more about benefit plans as we're answering questions because uh, we have some really intriguing questions so we do so by designing benefit plans to encourage employees to go to high value providers either with tiers inside the benefit plan or with uh, with low or no cost options through incentives our data analysis has shown that even with its incentives even employers that actually provide their employees a portion of healthcare services free, and the Alliance as an employer is actually doing that this year for, for our families. Um, we save so much money that we can pass those savings along to our employees. Through these strategies, many employers have not raised their employee premiums for multiple years. Affordability is only one piece of the puzzle. Employees also need to have access to a wide variety of products. So at the Alliance, we believe in developing and maintaining a broad, competitive, competitively priced network to ensure patients can get care wh where and when they need it. And we know through the hospital price transparency, we know um, we um, have um, the, our, our contracted rates are published. And so we know we have the best price contracts for the markets that we service. Our network, however, also includes alternative and independent providers in primary care, behavioral health. I believe our uh, VP of provider relations recently um, uh, did a tally of behavioral health providers, and we have contracted with 850 new uh, behavioral health providers, including working right now on a, on a very large uh, provider who, uh, when that contract is done, will bring another 2,800 providers nationwide. And by the way, we have a question of the connection of health and well-being to mental health uh, that I would like us to touch upon here in a second. So behavioral health, imaging, physical therapy, and many more to try to fill those gaps that we know exist when trying to, to uh, get care. 
Uh, we also need to educate, and I was uh, just very glad to see uh, that employers are doing a lot. The, the, our employers here on this webinar are doing quite a bit of uh, education. Um, we need to ensure that employees can take paid time off for medical appointments. They have access to transportation. They have access to wellness services. We know of employers that actually provide their employees several hours a week of wellness time paid uh, to help them with their wellness activities. Um, and, and we know that healthy employees contribute to our companies, to your companies, productivity, and with a recent almost 0% unemployment rates, this is more important than ever. So um, I hope you found that helpful. If you, if you or your brokers consultants need any help uh, implementing any of these strategies in your benefit plans, we're happy to talk to you. Please get in touch with me, get in touch with your account manager, uh, happy to help. So now I would like us to go back to our Q&A. Um, yes, uh, thank you. So Jessica, first question for you. How can we reach blue collar workers and get them activated for health and well-being activities? Shift like shift workers working on machines, et cetera. Yeah, and you know, I think a lot of this comes down to how we design the workplace, the workplace environment. And I know if if you're a multi-employer health plan, that can be sometimes very hard to influence, but making employers aware that it's not just individual behaviors that we need to rely on. The system has to support the behavior. And if we look into how organizations make safety a priority, for example, um, we know that safety initiatives become part of the culture. It's a part of the way people behave. And so we can take those lessons from safety and say, well, how do we design work? So it's actually easy to make the healthy choice. And so it's a part of, can we weave these health and well-being behaviors into the way work gets done? And we've seen some organizations do that. They have the healthy stretch breaks at the start of a shift, for example. They're offering free, healthier foods in common break areas. Um, and they're, they're incorporating, as, as you already mentioned, into allowing people to take advantage and participate during paid work time. This is a very important way to reach these workers because they might be working two or three jobs. They might have issues with transportation. They can't stick around and they don't have access to the kinds of resources they need to have access to in the home. And so it is really important to do as much as we can to leverage their available time at work. We can also encourage pure role modeling. One of the things that I found in actually my dissertation research when I was doing my PhD is men were more likely to participate in biometric screenings when they were at work sites that were predominantly men. When they were at mixed gender work sites, women did not have as much influence on the guys. But you know, you, you tend to see some people, a certain percentage of the audience is always going to lead in a certain direction. And when guys were in environments with more guys, their age group, and they saw other guys doing this, it influenced them more, which I thought was just fascinating. And so my takeaway from that is when we can encourage, when we have hard to reach groups, finding those individuals who do care about health and well-being, and then amplify their impact, make them a peer role model, make them a wellness champion, have them working with their peers. So peer-to-peer -peer activation is something we've seen quite a bit in public health and community settings. We can bring that into the workplace as well and train people on how to be a good role model <laughs> and help other people in their health and well-being journeys. We can also get feedback from employees. And I think employers might say that they do this, but it's really important when we ask for input that we actually listen. And we can change our attitude about hard to reach groups and say, you know what, we need your help. Partner with us to identify, will you take a look at this, this communication? What does this say to you? Does this make you want to participate? Sometimes we're not using the right language or sometimes it's just a minor tweak we need to make in how we design a program. They're like, well, those images don't look like me. This doesn't look like a program for me. And sometimes we're a little bit blind to that. If we can bring these hard to reach groups like blue collar employees, for example, or retail employees or other hard to reach groups and actually make them our, our partners, 
in developing effective programs. They can help us give us input we would never have thought about. So those are just some ideas. Oh, that's a fabulous answer. And the next question is very similar to that. So, uh, you know, we, we got a question on the blue color. The other, the, the, the next question is about 20 something uh, age group. So the kind of the younger um, age group, how do we motivate them? Um, I, I personally feel, of course, I, I need to let you uh, speak. I apologize. But I personally feel that uh, some of the younger generations, uh, younger than me, um, they're, they're very um, connected to a purpose. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to see kind of what your thoughts were about that as well. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was just reading some research the other day about how Gen Z and millennials are, you know, they think a lot about purpose and how am I going to give back and make a positive contribution? And that's influencing their work choices. When we look at offering health and well being initiatives, it's extremely important to ensure our offerings are relevant to their interests and health needs. We might see what's popping up on the claim side of the world or see what's popping up in some other part, for example, in workers' comp areas or in disabilities. But or in prescripts, right? What are what are our what are our pharmacy claims? And we might make assumptions about what we think their needs are. It's extremely important to analyze your data by these demographic groups and see are their needs a little bit different. We know that mental health and stress needs are the greatest with this age group. We know that loneliness and social isolation are at the highest for this age group. Suicidal ideation is at the highest for this age group, as is tobacco use and excess alcohol use. And part of that is they're self-medicating. And so mm -hmm. when we can better understand what the needs of this group are by asking them, by looking at our claims data um, a little bit more thoughtfully, we can start to say, okay, how can we meet the specific needs of this age group? And when, when that's a smaller part of your plan membership, it can be easy to overlook that, but the need is so great there because you're gonna maybe have those people on your plan or in your employer setting for a while. And there are a lot of benefits to getting upstream of some of these issues before they become really difficult chronic conditions. Um, so we talked a, a lot about relationships uh, for motivation. Uh, is that an internal motivation? Is it an ex external motivation or do you think it's both maybe? I think it's both and I have a shorter answer to this. If the motivation is based on external pressure, like peer pressure that someone else is exerting on you, and, and in some ways you're resistant to it, but someone is pressuring you into it, then that's extrinsic motivation. That's peer pressure. But when you are engaging in your own well-being because you feel good about being a role model or because you want to build a stronger relationship with other people, that if that comes from within, I have a value on this relationship and I'm looking for ways to strengthen it and improve our health because I care about this person, um, that can be a way for us to, it, the intrinsic motivation comes from ourselves. Now we have to be sure that we are not applying extrinsic motivation on the other person because that's not gonna help. So I, it really is sort of both sides of a coin, but we need to think about, well, the emphasis is on building a healthier relationship. One example from my life, which has been really helpful, my husband, hates the gym, and he doesn't like to exercise all that much. But one of the things we found is that if we go for a walk every day at four o'clock and we just listen to one another and talk about our work day, that's actually something that both of us feel like we've connected with one another. I have a sense for how his day went. It gives us separation between work and home. And we actually schedule our days. It's like, nope, four o'clock is our time that's when he would have been commuting but now that we were both work from home our commuting time is we do a two and a half mile loop and we have this conversation and what i have found is i don't need that extra walk i've done my workout earlier in the day but what i find is that that's like the best time to find out what's really going on in my husband's life at work because it's fresh in his mind and i can say how did your day go how did your meeting with your boss go and so the value is on the relationship in that time together, not on, oh, we're trying to do this for exercise. So that's just one example. Right, that is awesome. So um, what are some of the biggest barriers to wellness that you have seen? Well, I know you have a lot of answers to this question, so I'm just gonna name one. And I think 
the biggest, which I've mentioned a little bit already, is the mindset that well-being is something that we do on our own time. And I know when I was in an organization as a leader, I would do my training for my half marathons and have my healthy smoothies and practice my yoga before and after work. But what I didn't realize is when I take part in practicing my health and well-being during the workday, I'm actually a positive influence on other people. And it helps them to say, well, look, this is something that we all have permission to do and I can actually influence other people. And so that's why we need written policies, leadership participation, role modeling and communications that normalize participation during the work day. Health isn't before and after work, it's during the work day. And I think that's one of the biggest barriers we have to overcome as a society. Yeah, and actually my, my answer to this, you're right. Um, uh, my answer to this is very, very similar to that. And um, I was at an event uh, yesterday and I, there is a specific question uh, that I'm, so I'm gonna go back to that event uh, in a little while because there is a specific question for that specific industry sector, but um, leaders in an organization, CEOs, CFOs, directors, VPs of HR, leaders in an organization need to invest in our people. Uh, and we need to absolutely be mindful of improving access and affordability, not only to healthcare, but also uh, very much so to wellness. So I'll give an example from my own personal life now uh, and my company. I am, we uh, here at the Alliance are so blessed to be led uh, by Cheryl DeMars, uh, who not only, um, and I know she's watching, so she's going to be saying, oh my God, you're putting me on the spot, but that's okay. Not only she has a, a very strong purpose um, in her professional life, uh, she also um, is very, very caring, and she wants to make wellness um, available and affordable to all of us. So I know from my own personal life, um, the last five years that I've been working for uh, this amazing woman, I've been able to go to the gym every, every single day. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, giving me permission to actually say, OK, I'm going to stop work now. I am going to go to the gym because and I like taking classes. I'm going to go to the gym and then I'll get back to work just getting and, and giving this permission and also uh interestingly that you talked about role models uh she has all of these years that i've been working with her she has said to me i want you to be a role model uh to others so mm -hmm. just model your activity and and what you do so that others also have that permission to take care of themselves so how do we invest as leaders how do we invest to um our employees and their families that's very very important so access and affordability role modeling leadership participation um i think these are some incredible ways very far not very um difficult to do but very powerful to help us um break down some of the barriers mm -hmm. um so similarly what incentives and the question was besides financial uh, help encourage employees to care about um, researching providers before making their healthcare decisions, making sort of wellness and well-being decisions. And I know you're going to say, Melina, you have a lot of answers for that. So let me just start by saying that from our perspective, what we see is benefit plan design and consistent, consistent communication and role modeling is really what we have found to be very effective. Uh, what are some thoughts that maybe, Jessica, you have? Well, I'm coming off of a very intense part of my health journey because I had back surgery in December. And one of the benefits that the health plan provided to me, they sent me a letter, and it was to me. I don't get anything addressed to me from the health plan. It all goes to my husband. And so this really stood out in my attention. And they were aware because the I, I was seeing a lot of different providers related to my back. They were aware that I was about to undergo a surgery because the pre-approval had come in. And they just reached out and they're like, hey, looks like you've got something major going on in your life. We're here to help. We can help you figure out how much it's going to cost you out of your pocket. We can help you figure out what you can do in advance to make sure that surgery goes healthier or, or easily for you. We can help you with a uh, second opinion service. And so that was all in a letter. And because it came to me, to my name, I, I it caught my attention. I didn't just think of it as junk mail. 
And I was thinking, oh, it's something related to my back surgery. I hope they're not going to refuse the approval, right? So it had my attention, but then this really lovely letter encouraging me to reach out. And so I actually partnered with them to make sure I had the best possible doctor, that I was going to the right facility, and that I understood how much is this going to cost out of my pocket at the end of the day? Because I knew back surgery was not inexpensive. <laughs> Um, but then during that, I actually had some lovely conversations with different people that they were making available to me to help me understand what I could do before, during, and after the surgery to promote a healthier recovery. So they were a huge part of my help. And I think it was just those little things like making me aware at just the right time when that claim came in for the approval, where I was kind of anxious about, is this going to get approved? Am I going to have any hiccups in this? Um, that 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 caught my attention they communicated at that time in a very effective way and, and so one of our next questions is how do and, and you and i have talked about this quite a bit um somebody has written about a magic pill question and we'll get there next <laughs> but that to me is the magic pill how do we engage families uh on the health plan spouses dependents family members um you just we just had a conversation. You just gave us one idea uh, about how to do that. Um, any other thoughts? I, I have a couple thoughts as well, but I'm wondering if you had a, another thought as well. Um, go ahead and, and I'll, I'll let you know if I yeah. can springboard yeah. off of what you have. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I am very happy that your health plan actually reached out to you. Um, most likely your physicians authorization request triggered uh, for them because, as you said, back surgery is very, very expensive. I don't know that health plans necessarily do that for every single service. I, I think that your specific uh, situation was flagged because it is, it tends to be on the very high end uh, of surgeries. Um, we talk a lot with employers about advanced primary care. Mm -hmm. uh, and so oh, it, some folks know it as direct primary care. We like to call it advanced primary care. Um, these are independent physicians that have a direct relationship with their patients. And through these independent primary care physicians, um, part of their value proposition is to get in touch with family members. Uh, so at the Alliance, uh, we just are offering um, in one of our health, two health plans, uh, we're offering direct primary care free to our enrollees. Uh, now we also, we have kept an HSA plan and we're not allowed by regulation to offer sort of free services in a in a high deductible health plan, but we do on our copay plan, and I'm I'm personally on that plan as well. My husband, for the first time in his life, is so engaged because he's visiting. In fact, he's seeing his physician today. Our physician, our primary care physician, uh, is calling him and emailing him and saying, "Hey, you need to come see me. We need to run uh, the labs again." Um, and she engages with me on a quarterly basis as well. So um, a sure way of being able to talk to dependents, uh, talk to our family members is through a good relationship with a good primary care physician. And typically, I'm, I'm not claiming that systems, primary care physicians that are um, in systems don't do that. But typically, we have found that independent primary care physicians have more time and have more um, aptitude uh, to uh, get in touch with our family members. So that's kind of one of the answers that we see working really very well. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that? No, let's. We, I know we have a lot of questions, so let's move on to another. Yes, one. yes, yes, and it, time is running out. So uh, the magic pill question: Is there a one thing that can produce the most results? You think? You know, I don't think that there are magic pills out there, but I think one that we haven't talked about that is um, something that research has shown to be very, very effective is establishing some sort of grassroots network that can get employees involved in informing what you're doing with your health and well-being efforts. And some call these ambassador networks, some call them wellness champion networks. These are people who might have jobs working on the 
production line. They might have jobs working in administration, all sorts of different kinds of jobs. But the key is to recruit for those wellness champion networks, not just people who are passionate about a healthy lifestyle, but it's people who represent hard to reach groups. This is the perspective we need. We can't, I know at one university, they couldn't get faculty to participate in anything because faculty thought that's for staff, that's not for us. And so they actually developed a small wellness champion group of just faculty members. In other organizations, like I was at 3M, this was decades ago, and we engaged specifically a group of hardcore older male engineers that were taught to be highly critical of everything. That's what it means to be an engineer. Okay. And so we right. said, be critical all over our program. Show us where we're screwing up as part of a pilot. And so we piloted every single program by them. And they told us, this is too touchy-feely. This is too woo-woo. This is too out there. They helped us to change how we call it, what we name things, mm -hmm. what kinds of images we used, how we communicated about them, how we packaged things. This is too slick. It makes me not trust it. Um, before we actually rolled it out to the rest of the population. And so I think being creative about how we engage the grassroots in unique ways to make them our partners instead of you know people we do things to <laughs> can be a very effective way. And I think you can do that as part of a plan as well, but it's part of extending that invitation. Awesome. Now, where should employers start when implementing, uh, implementing the motivational strategies? Uh, you spoke um, about in their organization? Well, I think part of it is looking at what your strengths are. I like to start with strengths. <laughs> so look look to see where, where you have the most advantage and most leverage and start there. And so it can be part of, well, what, what's been successful for us in the past? How could we adapt some of these ideas into that area that we've succeeded in the past? And so it takes some creative thinking. Um, but that's one thing because every organization is different and it's hard to know where to start starting where your strengths are i think is a really good place to start and then build on them over time that's sort of a non-answer i know but there's not no one size fits all here and uh is there a way to measure the success of well-being and engagement in initiatives so i will refer people back to since 75 percent of you did not attend the one last year Last year, we talked a lot about what does it mean to engage people in health and well-being? How do we measure that? And I provided a lot of resources on how can we actually be measuring deeper levels of engagement in health and well-being. So I'm going to refer people back to that session. <laughs> Fantastic. So the next question, uh, with your permission, I'd like to take it because I want to give an example, a real-time mm -hmm. Uh, example of what an employer said uh, to a group of other employers uh, yesterday evening. So the question is, so we talked about blue collar, we talked about different age groups. Uh, the question uh, that we got was improving engagement for uh, employees who work in the hotel and restaurant industry, so the hospitality uh, industry. So uh, yesterday, uh, myself and several of my colleagues were at a um, an open house of a new healthcare offering in the La Crosse area here in Wisconsin. Um, the healthcare offering is called Viaro Health. Uh, it is uh, owned and led by an organization, an employer, an, or, uh, an organization called the Weber Group. And they're absolutely in the real estate, hospitality, uh, restaurant business. And they actually started that um, journey uh, to help their own employees. Because if you start thinking about uh, employees in the hospitality uh, industry, first of all, they're on fixed income. Uh, often um, in, in our country, um, speak a different language. Uh, so they, they are, um, potentially maybe not even um, um, English speaking uh, folks. So Mr. Don Weber, the president of the Weber Group, at the end of all the presentations, we asked him to say a few words. And the passion that came out of this gentleman um, about his employees, uh, who he called families, he, he said, these are not my employees, these are my families, our families, and who spoke from the heart about how CEOs of companies need to invest in their own people. 
and um, he talked quite a bit about. So he uh, so so the offering this new healthcare offering is a direct primary care uh, facility uh, that started as direct primary care for the Weber Group employees primarily because um, his employees don't as I said they're on a fixed income. They don't necessarily have access to uh, a healthcare system. Some of them are not even on the health benefit plan. Some of them are working multiple jobs. Some of them don't speak English. So just going to the local system uh, is not necessarily the best answer for them. Uh, so of course, uh, his new offering, their new offering, the Weber Group's new offering, Viaro Health, is multilingual. Um, they're offering uh, physical therapy, behavioral health, wellness, and well being. Here's the thing that sort of uh, struck me the most. He went to his board several years ago and he said, I want to offer my employees three hours of wellness paid time each week. And he said, my board of directors started, you know, putting the numbers together, three hours times how many employees how, times how many weeks. That's a lot of money. And he said, no, no, that's my investment, our investment as a board to our own community and to our own people. So um, I have asked our marketing uh, team to get in touch with him to see if we would have him on a webinar, um, just the passion and the that investment. So. Uh, I will say kind of the, the magic bullet here, although there are no magic bullets, really giving access to your employees, free access if you can to direct primary care, hopefully uh, multilingual, hopefully primary care that's closely related uh, or has an attachment, has a connection with behavioral health, with PT, with um, other, um, other services. And I don't, I'm not certain who asked that question, but if you don't know who to get in touch with in your community, please um, give us a call and we're happy to help uh, find services for you. Um, so talking about mental health, Jessica, um, you talked a lot about uh, what does it mean to have a sense of purpose? And uh, let's connect. And then you also talked just now about the, the, the sort of millennials and ex geners and kind of the need, the, co the connectivity, the need to connect with mental health care. So the question is, where do we need to be in terms of mental health care in order to be able to support uh, our employees in the best possible ways? And I see great connection between wellness, well-being, of course, and uh, behavioral health, right? So uh, what do you think about that? Well, there's so much need there. And, and, and it's like multi-layer because it's about you know, the awareness and the stigma piece, but then there's, you know, if people want the help, can they get it? You know, some people might be on waiting lists for months. And so that's like, you've talked a lot about barriers to access. There's so much we need to break down there, but I think one thing we can really do is go upstream. And so doing things like helping people to think about their purpose and their values and, having them build solid, healthy relationships as part of their work, strong, stronger workplace connections actually can help a lot with mental health. We know that loneliness and isolation is in some cases got higher links to mortality and morbidity than other typical health suspects, health behaviors that we think about. And so there is a, an extremely strong and a growing evidence base that connects the link between social support, relationship support, purpose, with well-being, and so that allows us to go upstream and build resilience so that when people do have these challenges in their life, they're actually more resilient to overcome them. And people who have access to these kinds of programs that support social support, stronger connections, developing a sense of purpose and meaning, even if they've had a depression or an anxiety episode in the past, research shows that when they have these supports available to them, it makes them more resilient to subsequent episodes. So I think go upstream as much as we can, even as we solve the downstream issues of access. I'm gonna stop us there. I know we have more questions. You know that we have more questions, but I, I also know that you and I can be talking for hours on this subject. <laughs> uh, so uh, we'll see what the next steps are, right? I wanna thank you. Thank you for your time today. Please everybody, I know you cannot 
we have you on mute. Uh, but uh, join me in thanking um, Dr. Jessica Grossmeyer uh, in her wisdom and her work and uh, your passion, Jessica. And thank you to everyone who attended and participated in today's webinar. So that's going to wrap things up. Uh, remember, uh, we're here to help you. Uh, if you need resources, help with your benefit plan design, absolutely um, uh, give us a call. Uh, maybe you can take me to the next slide, uh, Barb. Thank you. So you will receive an email following today's event with a short survey and also directions on how to apply for C credits. We do appreciate your feedback. Um, any feedback you have uh, as we work to improve these events and bring you as much value as possible in the future. The slides from today's event will be made available on the events page on our website. And you heard Dr. Grossmeyer, we keep those events for quite some time. So even last February's event is there. If you would like a copy of any of the handouts and you were not able to download them uh, during this live session, please send an email to events at the-alliance.org and we will be happy to email you a copy. We're also accepting nominations for our Health Transformation Awards, uh, Healthcare Transformation, Transformation Awards. Visit the Alliance website for details or scan the QR code on your screen uh, to access the nomination form. We are welcoming any and all uh, individuals who are working side by side with all of us to change our healthcare ecosystem and bring innovation to our market. Please remember to save uh, the date for our upcoming events. We have uh, another webinar on April 13th on how to choose your partners in self-funding. And we'll be back in person uh, and online with our hybrid spring symposium on Wednesday, May 17th. Uh, we are lining up an outstanding program for both events. I hope to see you there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the privilege of your time again. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.